At the end of the 2016 college baseball season, the Kentucky Wildcats were at a crossroads. Their season ended abruptly following an opening round loss to Alabama in the SEC tournament. It was a punch to the stomach considering how much promise the team had shown in the beginning of the year. After a strong start to their non-conference schedule at the beginning of the season, the Wildcats went on to win their first four SEC conference series in a row, becoming one of the more surprisingly good teams out of the conference and in college baseball as a whole. After appearing in a couple of preseason polls, they reached their peak during week eight, holding the number nine position in collegiate baseball newspapers poll. Ironically, or maybe not really, that stretch became the only highlight of the season. Kentucky would go on to lose their next three weekend series in a row to Vanderbilt, Arkansas, and Auburn before winning two of their last three series against South Carolina and Missouri to somehow salvage the year. Kentucky finished 15-15 and in the SEC in 2016, fourth in the Eastern Division and tied with Alabama for sixth in the SEC as a whole. In a conference tournament that saw two teams with a 9-21 and record in conference play take the field, Kentucky held the eighth seed needing to get past Alabama and move on to the double elimination round and face Mississippi State. In the top of the ninth, with Alabama holding on to a close 3-2 lead, Will Haney hit a two-run homer to add insurance runs for Alabama. A flyout to right field ended Kentucky's underwhelming season, their hopes for an NCAA tournament berth all but dashed. With that conclusion, there were many things to consider. How in the world could the season take a nosedive that quickly after such a promising start? Fans were understandably frustrated considering the program itself had become stagnant over the past two years. When it comes to the previous five seasons, 2014 had to be the best in terms of their postseason performance. Having a slightly worse record than 2016, the Wildcats reached the semifinals of the SEC tournament where they ultimately lost to Florida. They earned their second bid to the NCAA tournament in three years and headed to Louisville to play in a regional. They ultimately lost to their arch rivals in the regional finals after battling through the loser's bracket following a loss to Kansas in the opening round. Despite the end of that season, the Wildcat faithful, as few as they probably were, had faith that the program was headed in the right direction. That faith following the 2016 season had wavered. Many wondered what the next step could be. Should Kentucky let go of head coach Gary Henderson, the one who had been there since their slow rise to one of the less awful teams in the SEC? What about the stadium, Cliff Hagen, that was in dire need of replacement, considering it had been the home for Kentucky baseball for over 47 years and hadn't had a renovation in over 14 years? If this program was gonna make any improvements for next season, questions needed to be answered and moves needed to be made. Surprisingly, head coach Gary Henderson answered the first question for Wildcat Nation. On June 1, 2016, two days after the Wildcats were left out of the tournament, Henderson announced his resignation. Addressing the fans, he stated that coaching in the SEC is not a job. It's a lifestyle. All aspects of the job, from recruiting to player development, are all consuming and require a 24-7 365 commitment. Henderson's raw perspective on the duty of serving as an SEC coach earned sympathy from UK Athletic Director Mitch Barnhart. That decision to resign, however, may have also stemmed from the impatience of fans for the program to become one of the better ones in the SEC. Henderson has been a coach for over 30 years and has coached all over the country, most recently the University of Florida before accepting an assistant position at Kentucky in 2003. In 2009, he was promoted to head coach after former head coach John Cohen left for Mississippi State. Now, after over 13 years, his time in Lexington was over. This unexpected transition led Kentucky scrambling to fill the position. The question, however, was who? This program needed a coach who was going to have a spark. They needed someone who was going to light a fire under the Wildcats and set the Southeastern Conference ablaze. The future reputation of the program depended on it. Two weeks after Henderson's resignation, the University of Kentucky announced that they had hired former Kentucky assistant coach and current Mississippi State assistant coach Nick Mangione. Mangione was ecstatic about the opportunity, saying that he dreamed about it and called it an incredible feeling to return, according to a press release from UK Athletics. It was with this hire that Kentucky hoped to revive its success from the early 2010s. With over half the team returning, there was hope. That hope was tested early, more specifically right at the beginning of the season. The Wildcats quickly fell 0-4 at the start of the regular season, getting swept in Chapel Hill during an opening weekend series against North Carolina and losing a midweek to rising mid-major powerhouse Liberty. All losses were close, a sign that maybe the Wildcats would be able to add some games to the win column soon. 
soon came rather quickly as the Wildcats went on a hot streak, winning eight of their next nine games, including a series sweep of the 2016 College World Series participants, UC Santa Barbara, at home. The looming schedule of the SEC didn't seem to phase this team as they won their opening conference series against Texas A&M, a super regional participant back in 2016 and College Station. They then continued wreaking havoc on the SEC, winning series at home against Ole Miss and Vanderbilt. The Wildcats began to get their well-deserved recognition in the polls with them entering in most of them around late March. For the fans, it was exhilarating. This is something that they had been wanting for decades. Mingione was truly that spark. In April, they rarely fell out of step, winning three of their four conference series, only losing to their current and former head coach's team, Mississippi State, in the first weekend of the month. I mean, was there anything stopping this team? Well, yes, the month of May. The month of May was stopping this team. Any college baseball coach, player, or fan knows that May is the last month you want your team to begin to fall out of step. Well, it happened to the Wildcats. Like other unfortunate teams, Kentucky lost its footing in May, losing a series to Georgia at home before sweeping Tennessee and then losing their final regular season conference series to the Florida Gators. Nonetheless, the Wildcats finished 19-11 in conference play, second behind the Gators in the SEC East. They earned a number three seed in the SEC tournament, sitting out in the play-in tournament round and waiting to play the winner of Vanderbilt and South Carolina. In the SEC tournament, the Gamecocks came out on top in the play-in round and Kentucky beat them soundly 7-2. It looked as though, however, that they had given all their offensive juice to Game 1, as they were shut out against LSU in the third round and eliminated by South Carolina in an elimination game. For any other team, perhaps the 2016 Kentucky team, this would have been a problema grande. Not for this team. It doesn't really matter where you finish in the SEC tournament when you finish third overall in the entire conference. The selection committee made sure to make note of that as the Wildcats were given their first regional seed in the SEC tournament since 2006. They were given the number 10 seed squared up to face their arch rival Louisville in a super regional should they dare to venture that far into the tournament, something that they had never done before. Kentucky faced Ohio, NC State, and Indiana in their Lexington regional. Behind a stellar pitching performance by Sean Jelly, Kentucky avoided a late inning comeback to win the opening game 6-4. In Game 2, after an early innings back and forth between Kentucky and NC State, the Wolfpack blew the game open with a three-run fifth to take the lead 5-2. The Wildcats scored two runs in the 7th and the ninth, but it wasn't enough as they fell into the loser's bracket with a heartbreaking 5-4 loss. Fighting to avoid the eliminated walk of shame back to their dorms, the Wildcats outslugged Indiana 14-6, scoring six in the sixth inning. They had to face NC State yet again, and this time it was to stay alive. They got the job done in a must-win game, forcing a winner-take-all in the regional final. In the regional final, the Wolfpack led 5-4 going into the seventh inning until Kentucky pushed three runs across behind a fielding error in an RBI double to take the lead 7-5. The Wildcats shut it down in the ninth, scoring five insurance runs and earning their first Super Regional appearance in program history. The Wildcats couldn't celebrate for long. They had a tough road ahead of them to get to Omaha for the first time ever. The Louisville Cardinals had an overall record of 53-12 and and were a preseason top 10 team. After an underwhelming showing in the ACC tournament, they earned a measly number 7 seed in the NCAA tournament. They swept the regional against Redford, Oklahoma, and Xavier. In Game 1, the Cardinals simply outplayed the Wildcats. Kentucky missed an opportunity to strike first in the first inning, and Louisville made them pay, scoring two to take the early lead. The Wildcats could get absolutely nothing done against Louisville's Cade McClure. They had another opportunity in the fifth, but just couldn't capitalize. This time, the Cardinals really blew it open, scoring three in the bottom of the fifth inning off of a home run by Drew Ellis. Kentucky cut into Louisville's lead, scoring two in the top of the ninth, but by then, it was too late. In Game 2, Louisville dashed Kentucky's hopes of their first College World Series berth. Drew Ellis owns Kentucky. He wasn't done making it rain with a homer in the second to give the Cardinals a 1-0 lead. Neither team was able to push a run across until the fifth when Louisville earned one on an RBI flyout from Devin Mann to make it 2-0. Kentucky got on the board and cut the lead in the bottom half of the inning, but the Cardinals pulled away in the sixth, getting two more runs off of, you know it. I don't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Drew frickin' Ellis. 
and an RBI triple from Josh Stowers. The Wildcats threatened with two men on in the sixth, but couldn't push a run across. They got one back in the seventh, but again, too little, too late. Louisville scored two more insurance runs in the eighth to make it 6-2 to two and punched their ticket to Omaha for the third time in five years. By no means was the ending of the 2017 season a disappointment to the Wildcats. Louisville was a good team and it was a hard-fought series. Hell, a hard-fought year. Kentucky had the best season of its entire existence in 2017 and to everyone, players, recruits, coaches, and fans, it was only up from here. Kentucky had established itself as being one of the top teams in the SEC, really the entire nation in 2017. Surely this success could be continued in 2018, right? Well, mm, judging by the title of this video, it's safe to assume that this wasn't the case. But before we get into these next couple of seasons, let's set the scene for 2018. Coming off of the hype of 2017, the Wildcats were ready to take the field again. For the first time in a long time, they were getting some serious preseason clout. Despite a number of guys like Evan White leaving Lexington for the MLB draft, a lot of young talent like Cole Cotton and Tristan Pompey were eager to suit up for the Blue and White again in February of 2018. In the realm of the SEC, Kentucky looked to be a serious contender in the East. Every college baseball outlet had the Wildcats ranked in the top 10 in preseason polls. The only other two SEC teams ranked top 10 were Arkansas and of course the College World Series champions, Florida. At the beginning, it really looked like the hype was real. The Wildcats started out on the road, sweeping a weekend series in Spartanburg, South Carolina, before coming home to play their final first home game in Cliffhagen. Despite losing a midweek to Xavier, they bounced back and won their next four games, sweeping Oakland in a three-game series and beating Western Kentucky in a midweek. They hopped, skipped, and jumped over to the Shriners Classic down in Houston, sweeping that tournament as well and winning their next two midweeks at home. Alas, other than the Shriners Classic, those really weren't real opponents, right? Like, they haven't actually played anyone yet this season, so how could we really know how great they supposedly were? Well, that test came in the form of Texas Tech, national seed during the 2017 tournament. The Wildcats went toe-for-toe -toe with the Red Raiders at home, winning the first two games before dropping Game 3 by only two runs. After that weekend, the Wildcats secured their highest ranking the entire season, number 4. Yeah, maybe the schedule was soft at the beginning of the year, but so many other programs do that and continue to blow through their conference opponents right afterwards. The season is a marathon, but Kentucky has the stamina and they're going to crush Arkansas, right? No, not even close. To say that the Razorbacks handled Kentucky would be an understatement. They mutilated the Wildcats pitching staff, scoring 39 runs over a weekend series sweep. They bounced back with a series win against Auburn, but dropped another SEC West series against Alabama the weekend after. They came back and won the next two series against South Carolina and Georgia before losing the next series at home against the College World Series champs, Florida. If this season could be described as a piece of playground equipment, it would be a seesaw, up and down and up and down. The underwhelming end to their season came in the form of a sweep by Vanderbilt down in Nashville. They finished the season 13-17 and in SEC play and 5th in the SEC East. They barely reached the SEC tournament, earning a 10th seed and facing off against Auburn. Their chances at this point of avenging their Super Regional loss elimination were slim to none. They had to show out in this game to even have a chance. The Wildcats and the Tigers played like their seasons depended on it and were neck and neck knotted at 3 in the 11th inning. After the Wildcats failed to push a run across in the top half of the inning, Auburn's Edward Julian hit a walk-off single to right field, ending Kentucky's run in the SEC tournament and possibly their season. Like dozens of other anxious teams, on May 28th, the Wildcats sat patiently, waiting for their name to be called. It never was. The Wildcats missed the postseason, ending their season on a solemn note. When speaking of Kentucky's omission from the tournament, head coach Mengione said, there's been a lot of talk about us only having 13 wins, but I don't think anybody in our league should be punished for how good it is. There's other teams that if you put them in our league, I'd be curious to see how they shape up. Yeah, he was a little agitated, but could you blame him? There was a lot of pressure to back up the success of 2017. Kentucky also had a top 30 RPI and were 500 against top 50 RPI opponents as well. They also had a winning record for away games. There was a case to put them in, but ultimately it was up to the committee, and they weren't going for it. 
South Carolina's athletic director, Ryan Tanner, put it simply, I think anybody that follows college baseball recognizes Kentucky has a great club, but there are some metrics we look at in the selection room, and one is a sub-500 record against conference competition. There's only one team in that field that was sub-500 against conference competition. It was a glaring weakness against Kentucky. Heading into 2019, the hype and the pressure of Kentucky's baseball program to perform had all but dissipated. That, especially for a college baseball program, can be exactly what they need to perform. This was a completely different team for Kentucky. They would have to get readjusted. It wouldn't be too off the plate to assume that this might be a rebuild year for the Wildcats. Did I say it was safe to assume? Yeah, it's very safe to assume that this was a rebuild year for Kentucky. The Wildcats were god-awful in 2019, going 28 and 29 and having finished under 500 for the first time since 2011. They were dead last in the SEC East and were tied with a, you guessed it, roll tied for the worst record in the SEC, going 7 and 21. Well, Mingione, there's absolutely no argument for this one. Actually, I think that if you put Northeastern in there this year, they go at least 8 and 20, just saying. The Wildcats missed the SEC tournament for the first time since 2011 and of course missed the NCAA tournament for the second year in a row. In 2020, the Wildcats finished 11 and 6, getting swept twice against TCU in the opening weekend and wait. Be so for real. There's absolutely no way. Are you serious? They got swept at home against UNC Wilmington? Throw the program away. Just throw it away at this point. There is no saving this program. I'm just kidding. Maybe. But in 2021, the Wildcats looked to be improving slightly, going 29 and 23 and 12 and 18 in their conference. Mid, but in the most respectful way possible. In 2022, Kentucky got even better. It's crazy saying that considering how good they were supposed to be four freaking years ago, going 33 and 26 and again with that freaking 12 and 18 conference record. The only highlight that this team had in 2022 was beating the consensus in one of the most hated number one teams of all time, Tennessee, late into the season. Sorry, Big Blue Nation, that and another short stint in the SEC tournament is not going to get you that bid into the NCAA tournament. You're not Ole Miss, unfortunately. All right, you guys, final thoughts on the most disappointing program in college baseball. So do I think that Kentucky is going to have a good year in 2023? The answer to that question for me is I am going to have to lean towards no. This team does not have a culture of being one of the better teams in the SEC and there are a lot of college baseball outlets that you know are trying to say that oh you know Kentucky's going to have that bounce back year. I do feel like going 12 and 18 in the SEC two years in a row after back in 2019 you went 9 and 21. I will say that or 7 and 21 it might have been 7 and 21. I will say that that is a step up but you know what is certain and you know what is going to be a guarantee. If Kentucky is not successful in 2023, he will not be Kentucky's head baseball coach. If I'm the athletic director, I've given this man several years to turn Kentucky baseball into a better SEC baseball program than it was when Gary Henderson resigned. Even though he had that really good 2017 season, he showed a lot of promise. He has not backed it up since then. And in my opinion, I wouldn't feel this way if I was an athletic director unless I spent almost $50 million on a ballpark and new facilities. Now, if you put that much money into your baseball program, you need to want to win. And you need to want to hire people who are going to win and let go of people who you feel like are not giving you the production that you invested $50 million in. So in my opinion, I think he's out after 2023 if they fail to make the NCAA tournament. It's not enough to make the SEC tournament at this point. You've been given so many chances. It is time to get better or get gone, basically, in my opinion. Gary Henderson. So former head coach of Kentucky. So after he announced that he was resigning from Kentucky baseball, he ended up getting an assistant coaching position at Mississippi State. And Mississippi State 
had hired a head coach at the end of 2017 but some scandal and something happened like at the beginning of the 2018 season or it might have been before the beginning and Gary Henderson ended up being promoted to interim head coach because of all this chaos that was going on. Now if you guys follow college baseball or maybe you don't, in 2018 Mississippi State was the Cinderella team. They were the most surprising team in college baseball by far. They were one of the last four teams into the tournament, I believe, and they ended up making it all the way to Omaha, eventually losing in the College World Series semifinals to Oregon State. After the 2018 season, Gary Henderson was given, you know, all these honors, and he was talking it up. He was like, you know what? I want to be back. I want to be the head coach of this Mississippi State team. And John Cohen, the athletic director at the time, he was like, nah, no, you are not going to be the head coach of this program. We are actually going to give the job to Chris Limonis, head baseball coach at the University of Indiana. And it kind of begs the question. It's like, did his resignation letter to Kentucky have anything to do with the fact that he was not given that head coaching position? And when it comes to that question, I am going to sit up here and I'm going to say 100% yes, that had everything to do with it. They, Mississippi State was not playing that. He was like, you are not going to get this job. And then two, three years down the line, sit up here and be like, listen, I can't do it. This is not just a job, it's a lifestyle. Because you, if at the end of the day, Kentucky is tame. I would argue that the only sports that Kentucky really cares about is basketball. And then if it's not basketball, it's football sometimes. Because football was kind of looking good, but they always disappoint. I feel like Kentucky football always disappoints its fans. So it's really about John Capolini or something, I, I don't know what his name is, but it's really about him and his basketball team. Like Kentucky really wasn't even pushing Gary Henderson like that to like make this team win, <laughs> you know? So at the end of the day, if that's how you feel and you're at the University of Kentucky, you are gonna feel 10 times worse being in Stark Vegas and having to coach in the SEC West and with Mississippi State because those fans at Duty Noble those fans in Starkville do not play when it comes to their college baseball program. That program has been one of the top programs in the country now for the past 30, 40 years. They don't play. So if you couldn't even handle it in Lexington, you're not going to be able to handle it in Starkville. And that's exactly what John Cohen was saying. He was like, nah, it's not going to work. But Gary Henderson is currently the head coach at the University of Utah with the Utes. Best of luck to him on his season and all that stuff. And, you know, Chris Limonis, I, you know, he kind of has done a pretty good job with Mississippi State at this point. Like, I think they went to Omaha the year after that. I think one of the guys on his team, Jake Mangum, is like the all-time SEC hits leader, actually, I think. And I think also that they ended up winning the College World Series in 2021. So good move by John Cohen. And I think he made the right decision. And you know, it's crazy in Stark Vegas, baby. They're gonna have that bounce back year in 2023 for sure. And <laughs> last thing, last point. Let's talk about coaching in the SEC. Just a little, just a little kind of talking about coaching. So, you know, I feel like Coach Henderson was actually onto something when he was talking about coaching in the SEC and I say that to say like it is a lifestyle like it's really not a job and I feel like a prime example something that I can really show you is this picture right here just look at it okay so if you guys don't know but you should know if you watch college baseball and this is head coach Tim Corbin head coach of Vanderbilt baseball has been there I want to say for over 15 years definitely over 15 years and the Vandy boys have done a very thorough job with wearing this individual out. He, he's been through a lot. He's been through a lot of talent, I would say. David Price, Sonny Gray, Dansby Swanson, Walker Bueller, you know, Jack Leiter, Enrique Bradfield Jr., Kumar Rocker. You know, he's, he's coached a lot of the greats, developed a lot of the greats. But, you know, the Vandy boys have worn him out. 
And you know, I don't want any former Vandy boy or current Vandy boy or whatever coming up in my Instagram comment section, in my YouTube. I don't have a Twitter. Don't come in my LinkedIn talking about some, oh, we didn't do anything to this coach. He blah, 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 blah. Nah, let me tell you something right now. I had a prime example of a time where y'all wore this man out. And it actually happened very early in his coaching career. And this is probably when he knew, like, this is a lifestyle. This, this is not just a job for me. I'm going to have to really, this is a lot. Because I already have this stuff. And I have to say stuff because this is YouTube. But I already have this stuff going on. And now I got to deal with this. Roll, roll the clip. And David said, Price leaves what? Vanderbilt said, for McDonald's. I don't want to go to school here anymore and I don't want to play baseball here anymore. And I said, okay, can you tell me reasons why? And he said, I'm not good enough to play here and I'm not a smart enough student to, to stay here. I said, okay. I said, what would you like to do? I wanted to go be normal. Um, and my brother had worked at McDonald's whenever I was a kid, and I remember him coming home with, you know, Mickey D's and, you know, bringing me a Happy Meal, and he you know, had his uniform, and I don't know why I thought the McDonald's uniform was, was cool with the hat and, and whatever it was, you know, I just, you know, I remember telling Coach Corbin, you know, I just want to be normal, I want to, I want to go work at McDonald's. And when he said that, I, I said, you know what, I said, I think that's a wonderful idea. I said, I, I think you should leave Vanderbilt University, one of the best academic institutions in the world. You should leave our baseball program. And I said, I, I think you should start your working life at a fast food restaurant. I, I think you're qualified for that. But, yeah, listen. Y'all saw that? Because I saw that. That is what Tim Corbin has to go through. I don't, I don't want to pitch anymore. I want to work at McDonald's. Yeah, checkmate. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you guys like, you comment, and subscribe. I really do appreciate all the growth that I have received on this channel for the past month and a half. I do want to apologize for not necessarily, you know, being there for the past several weeks. I've just been trying to get adjusted with the new semester. But as you guys know, the college baseball season is going to be starting in less than a week. So we will have a college baseball week one preview coming out before the games start on Friday. That is basically it. I don't have anything else to say. I feel like I've talked for the past 10, 12 minutes, even after the video is finished. But you know what? That's what it is. That's what final thoughts are. But anyway, I will see you guys in the next video. I'm so excited for it. And yeah, that's it. Bye.